All right, here we go. Moving on. But I want to make my last few con comments in heats of formation. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. Okay, so we're going to look at this collectively three different ways. So this is a reaction. Now, yesterday we talked about heats of dissolution, and actually your two homeworks, your two part two questions you worked at were thermodynamics or calorimetries, more specifically, uh, through calorimetry and constant pressure calorimetry, which you're only really going to get. We get the delta H's. And we know that if a salt, and this is not a salt reaction, but if a salt dissolves and is exothermic, it must mean that the what? The attractive forces with the ions in water are going to be stronger, more energy is released, more stable than the individual what attractions that they started with. And of course, that's defined by Coulomb's law, okay? So we had Na plus yesterday that it was barely what? It was positive. It's Cl negative Na plus, and then we have calcium plus. Now, if we show that, I'm just going to quickly go there because I want to, all right? And here it is. We did calcium chloride yesterday. And there's our FAS zone. We're going to introduce a new zone today. Ooh, okay. Now, the heat of formation of calcium chloride could be looked at similarly to lattice energy. This is how much energy is released from the atoms to make this chemical. It's not lattice energy, because lattice energy is measuring uh, the atoms as gases all the way to the crystal. But in any case, it's a good relationship. So I have calcium chloride. And then I have three components as it breaks apart when it dissolves, okay? We have the two chloride ions, okay? So adding two chloride ions is going to give you twice the moles of what? The heats of formation. But the real elephant in the room is this bigger arrow. Na plus would be here. Why would calcium plus two, okay, dissolving in water, this is the products, aqueous. Why is... Of course, the extra chlorine adds to it, but why do you think calcium plus two is a, going to be a bigger heat of formation? It's plus two. Charges are higher, and if you lose two what? Two electrons, you get even smaller. Do not forget Coulomb's law was based upon the distance and size, inversely related to the force of attraction, and what? The size of the charge. We talked about it all year. Now, interesting enough, if we go to table I in the reference table, what if I had lithium chloride? Now lithium chloride, LiCl, breaks apart into lithium plus and a chloride ion. So you're going to have this chloride ion here. That's the same size. But believe it or not, lithium chloride is about, uh, let's just look at that because table I is our friend. We want to not miss it. So let's put table I up here because I like it. Okay. Oh, it just happens all the time with itself. Okay, I kind of like this one, it's a little burnt mark in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, look in the bottom. Okay, lithium bromide. Ooh, okay, I can barely see it, but hey, you can barely understand me, so I get it. Now, listen, LIBR, negative 48.83. Whoa, look at that. And look at NaCl. Remember, it was barely positive. If it's positive, what it means. What happened to NaCl yesterday when I put it in the, in the water? It got cold or it got warm? We started what? Here, and we went up a little bit. And it was only a little increase. Because the chemical, when it dissolves, absorbed a little bit of energy, which means the water got cold by a little bit. And why does it go up a little bit? Well, because it's hard. We definitely have a heat or formation of chlorine going down, but sodium's still a big ion, not only plus one. So water can't wrap its head around that. Its oxygens around it is easier. Look at so now lithium bromide. Now bromine's a bigger negative. Now it's, it's coming down here. It's a bigger atom as you go down. But look at lithium. How is lithium plus compared to Na plus? Well, lithium is. When it becomes plus one, doesn't it have electrons in the n equals one energy level? How small is that energy level? The smallest. So you're plus one in the smallest energy level. What's your Coulombic attractions? And that's why. LIBR is so what? Exothermic. It's going to have a big arrow because water can be stable and, and what? Attracted because it's so what? Coulombically attraction. So that's tied to everything we've done. Okay. So I wanted to make sure we had that understanding. So let's go on to this because we kind of did not get a chance to talk about 
what this means. Okay. We talk about the FAS zone. There's three things to look at, and this is important. So please, pretend you're paying attention. Give me like once in a while. Okay, yeah, 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 that's cool. And then go back to what you're doing. That makes me, me feel good. Now this is a reaction called combustion. We would call this heat of combustion, or delta H of comb. Sometimes you'll see it that way. It's like, wait a minute, it's the heat of my comb? Okay, no. It's comb means combustion. So remember, delta H has a what? A lot of names, right? Last, yesterday was delta H of vaporization, delta H of melting, fusion. You have delta H of dissolution. Isn't it all the same? It's describing a different process or reaction. So don't get lost in the sauce. You see heat of or delta H. It is all the same. The energy change from one position to another in the process or reaction. I say process because sometimes things aren't chemical reactions. They're what? Phase changes. We saw that this week. So here is a classic reaction. I've got propane. This is the gas that's in the tanks of your barbecues. We're gonna react with the oxygen in the air and it's gonna give off CO2 and water. This is combustion. It's exothermic. Here's where I started. Now what does this mean? This position here. This position means that the heats of formation of one mole of propane is this value. That's what this is, up from the fat zone. You with me? Good. All right, now it doesn't include oxygen because what is the heat of formation of any element? Zero. So really, this position here is the heat of formation, and energy has to be lost because we're creating bonds, correct? Now, what we're going to produce is three moles of CO2. So the, remember, this is the collective arrow. So there'd be three of these for CO2, and how many for the waters? And these are pretty stable, so this is going to be much lower. And there's a lot more what? Total energy <coughs> lost to make these compounds. These are all negatives, right? Okay, so we would say that the products are more or less stable. More stable because they have less potential energy. Don't get confused. Electrons that lose more energy as they get closer to the what? Nucleus are more what? Stable because they're held tighter. These are more stable because they release energy to get there, but a better way to think about it is they have stronger bonds. So if you lose a lot of energy to get here, you would need this amount to break them. That's what bond energy is, going the other way. Now, if people forget about stability, think about going to the city, because you see someone get off the train, right? Yo, what's up, what about my album? Yo, what's up, what's up? And you see someone who has got a lot of what? Energy. They're unstable. Why? Because they're going to do something with that energy. Who has a lot of energy? Why? Because they didn't lose a lot of energy, which means that only a little bit of energy was released to make these bonds, which means to break them doesn't take what? Much energy. So we're, with bond energies, we're just looking at it from a different perspective. That's it. So when looking for bond energies, don't forget, and I said this yesterday, that... The way to look at this and understand it is to look at what? This inter-nuclear distance diagram. Don't forget, this makes more sense, and that's why we keep learning and keep bringing back stuff. So I have H's. Here's my FAS zone, free atom zone that I call because that's where all the atoms have the highest energy. So we have hydrogens. Okay, now, now this is kind of weird because we don't measure this. Let's pretend that H's exist by themselves and they come together. So they come here. Let's say we could measure this change, okay? Now, what does this mean? We come here and what's happening? And where's the bond? And what's happening to the energy as they form? It's being what? What's having the potential energy? Is it going down or going up? Going down, it's getting negative. Why is it getting negative? Because energy is being released. It's getting stable in a bond. And what is this? This is either the heat of formation from, isn't this the fast zone? Free atoms? So the distance from here to here going down is the heat of formation. And if you want to break that bond, it's the what? Bond enthalpy. You call it the bond energy, but if you want to be cool, pinkies up always, okay? No, don't do that. <laughs> okay, but, what, um, but if you want to be cool, you say bond enthalpy. Oh, change of H of breaking the bonds. And the bond enthalpies will always be positive because we're always doing what? 
going in this direction. Okay, now, a couple of things about bond energies that we've already talked about, but I want to review. Okay, it's an average. Bond enthalpies are not the best way to get delta H's. And if you remember, going back to my internuclear diagram, which you must understand for the AP, is that atoms don't stay in this fixed position. They actually move. And think about this, what is this position? As two atoms come together right now. Now this is the average distance, or average distance, or which is tied to bond energy. Now, at this position right here, if you remember, we are minimizing the repulsive forces. What are the repulsive forces? The two positive protons. If we get too close, they start repelling each other, which means higher energy. If you're not close enough, you're not repelling, but you're not attracting electrons enough. So this minimizes the repulsive forces at this position. This is where you have the minimal repulsive forces, but the maximum attractive force of electrons. Here, you don't have repulsive forces of the protons, but you don't have maximum attraction for electrons. Here you have what? Repulsive forces dominating. The two nuclei are too close. Remember, this is a distance. So atoms are always absorbing energy and releasing it. So if I'm CO2, I like being CO2, because I'm free flying around the room. Why? Unless I'm at one, five atmospheres of pressure, I'm a gas flying around. That's pretty cool. 100 miles an hour. Let's see what that means. Now, except I collided with something. Oh my gosh, okay, now the point is, you can create the pressure. If I'm CO2, these are my oxygens. I don't sit like this. Hi, how are you? I'm normal. Okay, no, I'm not. I move like this, here's my O's. Or I move like this. These things move over this what? This distance by gaining or absorbing energy. That's why it's a greenhouse gas. So you think about these as having degrees of freedom. That's important today. Bigger molecules have more bonds, right? Therefore, they have more degrees of freedom, meaning if I'm a glucose molecule, C6H12O6, every bond can what? Independently wiggle and wobble. It's like, and therefore, a lot of movement going on there. They don't just stay there like this. Hi, how are you? Okay. Remember when, <laughs> anyone that walks up and does this, you just, what was that you just told me? The T thing with my son? You should do this? The T pose. The T pose. That's like, yeah, you don't do that. Okay. Now. Moving forward. So, party people. How do we use bond energies? Because the AP and college loves to throw this at you because you guys can memorize. You don't understand, so you're going to get this mixed up. So, if I'm going to use bond energies, watch. And this is important. I didn't have time to talk about this yesterday. We always talk about bond enthalpy as being positive because we're always doing what? Going up. If something is unstable, it takes what? Less energy to, to break all the bonds. If something is more stable, more energy released to get there, you need more energy to break the bonds. Now stay with me. If I have something exothermic, here's my fast zone, starting high, going low. Ooh, color change. Okay. This would be my bond energy to break the reactants. This would be my bond energy change to break the what? products. Now, I want delta H, which is what? The difference, is this going up or down? Right, the change of this state function is going down, so it's negative. How do I get a negative value? Should I do, because you guys are robots, it's always products minus reactants, it's always products I memorize. No! I need to show and keep a thermodynamic sign telling me the change is going down. So I must use this bigger positive minus the smaller positive to get a negative? No. No. For bond energies, we must take the sum of the bond energy enthalpies, okay, of the what? Yeah. Reactants. And then it's going to be minus the sum of the bond enthalpies of the products. And that will give us the right sign. Because if you measure these bond energies or enthalpies to break for the more what, stable compound, it's bigger. Small minus bigger gives me my what? Negative number. It's opposite of what you do with, with heats of formation. Okay? Now I have a way to remember this. 
and this is important. Please hone in here. Actually, keep honing in because it's all important. In any case, okay, look. In a chemical reaction, chemical reaction means that you have to pull <coughs> atoms apart and then rearrange them, correct? Mm -hmm. Cool. To break bonds, don't you need energy? Yeah. So you use bond enthalpies this way. This is the energy needs. Every reaction must break the bonds first. Mm -hmm. So we take the bond enthalpies of the reactants, and they're going to stay positive. And then after we break them, they're in this zone, aren't we? And now they're going to reform, okay, into new compounds. Notice my arrow is down. That's the energy released to form new bonds. So think about that. I'm going to take the bond enthalpies, keep them positive, and I'm going to do what? Negative the bond energies or enthalpies of the what? Products. Another way of saying it is bond energies broken minus the bond energies release. Bonds broken minus bonds formed. Okay, why does that work? Every chemical reaction. People think, hey, in, in regions chemistry, they say exothermic reaction heats release. And my problem with that is you didn't say net. Every chemical reaction, there's heat released and heat absorbed. If it's an exothermic reaction, don't you have to absorb some heat to break the bonds? Hey, and don't you have to release some? What makes it exothermic though? There was more energy released and forming new bonds than breaking the bonds. If it's endothermic, starting low and going high, there is what? More energy absorbed to break the stable compound than energy what? Released to form a new one. Every chemical reaction has absorption and releasing of energy. When you say exothermic, that's a net release. Endothermic, a net absorption or consumption. Okay, so that's important you understand because someone sitting in here in a test that I give you will forget that bond energies are the bond energies, bond enthalpies of the reactants minus the products because it's what? Bonds broken, that's the first thing, minus bonds formed. And that's what I have here. Okay? And they, and they don't give you this. They give you this as the reaction, but they don't give you this. Okay. That concludes. I am not going to speak about heats of formation anymore. Okay? We're moving on from delta H, which took us a week. Okay? And as Tristan said yesterday, he was bothered by things that were endothermic. He said, how can endothermic reactions go? He said to me, how can something be endothermic and still go? Because if I'm taking heat from the universe, I'm going against the grain. Things in nature, don't they go from high energy to low? It seems like I'm going against the universe. And he's partly right and partly wrong. There are two factors that affect whether a reaction goes or not. By the way, we call that spontaneous. We talked about that in September. Now we're defining perfectly. There are two factors that affect while a reaction goes. The heat absorbed and released and the degrees of freedom of the particles, okay, of the system. Okay, let's, before I get to those specifics, let's take a step back and talk about the laws of thermodynamics. Now, there are three, I'll post the third here, I forgot to do that or I just didn't get a chance this morning. I'm always rewriting stuff. There are three important laws of thermodynamics. What's thermodynamics? The movement of energy. The movement of energy tells me something about reactions. We kind of see that now but we're gonna to move to whether a reaction goes or not. Why can't hydrochloric acid make hydrogen from copper? Not spontaneous, remember? Remember it was like positive, it was what, negative volts? Which means you had to add energy to make it happen? What is a spontaneous process? A process that once you start it, continues. So we're gonna start answering the question why something works, okay? Part of the answer is delta H. But it's not the only part. It's only one piece of the puzzle to explain why things are spontaneous or not. Okay, so that's where we're headed today. Okay, so today is most, one of the most important days in thermodynamics, except for Monday and then, every day that I teach is the most important. Okay, all right. Now, any case, talk about the laws of the, 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 the three laws, but there's four. I believe that they, and I don't know for certain, they made three laws and realized there's one law that governs all of them. And I said, darn it, we can't change it. It's already in textbooks, so we'll call it the zeroth law, because no one counts. Zero first, right? All right, let's see how much money's in my pocket. Zero, one dollar, all right? No one does that, all right? How many cars do I own? Zero, one, two. You don't start with zero, right? I don't know, so to me it's weird, okay? But here is the zeroth law. And listen, 
listen, listen, listen. This is earth shattering. Now, if the earth shatters, you're probably going to fall. So you should brace yourself. Hold on to your seats, please. So this is the zero flaw. Okay? Do I joke? All the time. Okay. But in the one place that I might not joke, and the earth shatters, you want to be ready. So here is the zeroth. Zeroth? Zeroth? I'm not sure. Banana or banana? Which one do you say? I said the same thing over. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you guys say copper or copper? Right. Okay. Now, zeroth law. This is earth shattering. Hold on to your seats. Now, right, I'll tell you when you have to hold on. Okay, so I'm going to have object A and object B. They are going to be in thermal equilibrium with each other. What does that mean? When I drop lead block in water, and then they were at different temperatures eventually, even though the water resisted temperature change because of its high specific heat, and the, the, the temperature of the lead changed more, the same energy was transferred. Theoretically, correct? Okay, so being in thermal equilibrium means what? They're both at the same, same temperature. temperature. Okay, now if I have object C in thermal equilibrium with B, please hold on to your seats. Listen, if you don't want to do it, you can fall and you can't sue me. All right, now, if A and B are in thermal equilibrium with each other, and now A and C are, doesn't that mean? Oh, oh yeah! Whoa! Okay. Yeah, C and B or what? Yeah! That's the zeroth law. And by the way, is anything happening? No. Nothing's happening. Everyone is in equilibrium, which if I remember the death of all processes. Everybody has the same thermal energy. There's no concentrated source. Okay? So that's nothing happening. Woo -hoo -hoo. Okay. One down. That's the so okay. Pick yourself off, dust your foot. I know the, the stuff came down from the ceilings. Okay. Here is the first law. Now this is happy. This is uplifting. This gives us hope. Yes. Keep hope alive. Yes. So the first law states that what? Delta E, internal energy of a system, is equal to the what? Q of the system plus the work of the system. These are path functions. And we know that the energy of the system change is equal to the what? Opposite energy change of the surroundings. According to this beautiful law, anything is possible. This, of course, is the law of conservation of energy. Anything is possible here. Why? Because the energy that my system loses is the energy that my surroundings gain. And look at this. Possibly, I can have any combination of paths. Think with me for a second. I've got an engine, an internal combustion energy. And now I have found a way, because of this law, I can convert all of the energy potential that's in gasoline and I can convert it to what? Tremendous amount of work and zero Q. I can make an engine 100% efficient. That means I can take a gallon of gasoline and travel over a thousand miles. Now the problem with that is that your engine or your car would have no heat. The heat that your car has is due to the Q that's given off by the engine, they're just gonna funnel. So you'd have to find another way to heat your car, but okay, we can figure that out. But maybe you'll do that trade-off for that. Well, that's cool! And then what? The energy that's released from my car and movement could, could go back into the car. Anything's possible. We can work to what? A perpetuating motion machine? Renewable energy that's, that's possible. Forget about it, there's no renewable energy. But this says maybe there is. This is everything is possible. Until you get to the bummer law. The bummer law states, the second thermodynamic says, no, 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 no. Uh, 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 uh. Everything isn't possible. There are, there are only certain pathways allowed. The second law states, 
that there's only certain pathways, certain paths the universe will what? Give you. Now the law goes, the delta S of the universe must increase, must be positive and keep increasing. Is this, is this enthalpy? No, it's entropy. We've got a new term. Now it's a state function. And from AP Bio, everywhere else, entropy, and people talk about the measure disorder. Oh, ooh, ooh. Entropy is a measure of the dispersion of a concentrated source of energy to a what? Less concentrated source. Now, party people, there are two parts to this. The energy that surrounds a system is related by two things. Please understand this. First and foremost, if I have a system and Q is released, the Q would be what for the system? Negative, the Q for the surroundings would be what? Right, so if I have an exothermic reaction, like the propane that we just talked about here, doesn't the grill get warmer? Sure. Now the gas particles that, are, that get in touch with that heat, do they move faster? Don't they disperse? Molecules spreading out or moving more is a form of energy, yes? You better understand that. In fact, every explosion is not due to the chemical directly. It's due to the gas molecules being made and moving fast. An explosion occurs because, yes, we create a lot of heat fast, but we create a lot of what? Gas molecules that expand. What creates the force of explosion are gas molecules. So mar particles moving more is a degree of freedom. And it's part of the delta S in the universe. So if heat is exchanged, it makes the gas molecules move farther away. And that's a dispersion of energy. Also, inside the system, I have molecules changing. What if I have one mole of a solid? Let's check out the reaction above here. Okay, check out this reaction. We have six molecules, correct? This is a gas. This is, so we have six molecules of gas. How many molecules here? Seven. Seven, and they're both gases. Did we increase the degrees of freedom? We only had six molecules that could move. I'm sorry, yeah, over here, and now we have seven. Just due to the change of molecules in the system from what, six independent moving to seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, have we increased the entropy of the universe? Yes, because in the universe we have the system. So we can measure directly the delta S of the system. And what do we know? For a spontaneous, for a process to work, the limitation is that the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings must be what? Positive. Must be positive, okay, for a process to work. You cannot do anything you want to do. You are limited, it's the bummer, by what the universe allows. What does the universe allow? Energy dispersing. It could be energy and heat dispersion, that's what we were talking about yesterday, or the energy due to particles increasing their what? Degrees of freedom, it's a combination. So yesterday, you told me yesterday, Tristan, how can something endothermic happen? Because if you're endothermic, aren't I taking heat away from the surrounding? Aren't the gas molecules slowing down around the reaction? It's getting colder, like the, like the what, the endothermic NaCl? So yeah, the surroundings entropy is what? Decreasing, right? Because of the what? Heat. But what was NaCl doing? NaCl was becoming what? And how, what, what, was I increasing the number of freedom? That overcame the bad energy transfer. So because NaCl did dissolve, did dissolve, it must have been, even though the surroundings went down because of the energy came out of it, this must have been big enough to offset it. There are two parts 
in order to understand whether the entropy, the, 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 the pathway allowable, the concentrated form to less works. The two components are the delta H, okay, and uh, what's happening in the system. The system's entropy was increasing enough to what? Overcoming the loss of entropy of particles going slower. And therefore, the entire what? Universe's delta S was being positive. If that didn't, it would not have dissolved. Hello, insoluble compounds. Insoluble compounds. Okay? Doesn't happen. So not everything. So anything's possible. Cool. No, we can't do it. You can't make a perfect engine. Heat must be released. If something happens, if I go from chemical energy to motion energy, I can't convert 100% of it. Some of it's got to be released as heat because we have to what? Increase the entropy of the universe. So every time I transfer energy, what's happening to the concentrated source? It's getting less. Okay. Now there's a third. Third law. Okay. And what's the third law? The third law, kind of silly, is the delta S of a system, or the delta, or I should say the absolute entropy, not a change, of all chemicals is zero at zero Kelvin. Which, by the way, we can't get to. So we got this beautiful law that anything is possible. No, it can't. You're limited by what is allowable based on something you can't attain. <laughs> we can't get to zero Kelvin. You know why I can't get to zero Kelvin? If I pull all the heat out away from an, an object that has no heat, isn't it more concentrated on the outside? And the second law of thermodynamics is going to allow what? heat to get in. Can we create an isolated system with no heat coming in? Because of the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? So again, yeah, cool, we can do it. No, you can't. Because of this one, which we can't attain. What? Okay. It's a theoretical value, but this is important. Okay? So I'm going to put up here, party people, this value. Okay? Party people, what we have in your thermo tables, notice it's not a change, it's absolute entropies. Now check this out. Absolute entropies are never zero because these are measured at this little zero. What's that zero? 298 Kelvin, one atmosphere of pressure, and we have how much of each one? A mole. You never have zero. The only time this is zero is if you're at what? Zero. Right. So party people, absolute entropies start it's something called, don't be an as, the as zone. Absolute zero zone. So you have zero entropy per particles because they're not moving. They have no motion. There's no degrees of freedom. It's just sitting there. Hi, how are you? I have no motion. I can't disperse anything. Now, how do we measure the entropies? S is actually equal to the Q at constant temperature over constant temperature. This is going to be in joules per Kelvin. All right, now, joules per Kelvin. Joules per Kelvin. Joules per Kelvin. Joules per Kelvin. Okay, perfect. The other ones are going to only be in what? So when you combine them, you're going to have to convert another problem people have. But we'll get to that today. Now, party people, how do we get an absolute entropy? We do constant temperature. Now, why do we use constant temperature? Because if you heat something, is it going to move more? Oh, that gets crazy. You need calculus to understand it. So we're going to keep constant temperature. So what we do is, we know we're starting from this zero. This is not the phase zone. It's the, don't be an as, as zone, right? So if I'm going to measure, okay, aluminum, it's 28.3. Well, we know what? It starts zero at this temperature. We measure it. That's its value. Now, things that are liquids and react, for instance, let's look at um, something else like this, arsenic chloride. It would have to melt first, right? Now, at, when something melts or phase changes, is the temperature constant? Oh, well, yeah, because what? Kinetics converted to potential? We can measure the energy change at a phase change. So we'd measure that. And then we'd measure it again at that temperature. 
So we add up all of the constant temperature. By the way, constant temperature is important because party people, if I have a constant temperature, if I have a constant temperature, then what? Well, most things re react in constant temperature. Your body is regulated, okay, yes? Mm -hmm. At constant temperature. Engines are regulated by a thermostat. And by the way, if I burn a piece of paper, does the room change temperature? Isn't the surrounding universe room so big it's not gonna change much temperature? Correct, so we can use that. So now, how do we use delta S's? So, it's a, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> delta S's. And now, now we're here in Kentucky, all right? And so if you're looking at this and say, we don't speak that way, I have no idea, okay? We are Yankees up here, yeah. All right, so, how do we use this, okay? This is important. We use this value from tablature to get the delta S of the universe. Yes or no? No. We get this to measure the degrees of freedom change of my what? System, okay? Of my system. I'm gonna talk for five more to get to the same position and I'll give you the break in between. And so let me just finish this off. Okay, so if I wanna measure, it's important that we get the delta S of the system. Why? It's important. Delta S of the universe is what? equal to the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the what? Surroundings. Party people, we can only measure the system. This gives me the system. Now what is this? This is important. This is the degrees of freedom change. I'm at zero if I'm at zero what? Kelvin, third law of thermodynamics. Hi, how are you? I can't move. But at 298, don't I have some motion? Cool, then therefore I have some degrees of freedom. Now check this out. Let's go find a gas. Look at argon. It's 154.848. Look at a solid or any other solid. Why is the why does an atom jump through the roof as a gas as compared to a single atom that's a solid? It's flying around the room! It's got more degrees of freedom, so gases, of course, are gonna have a higher, what? Value from entropy, correct? Yeah. Cool. Now, what about if you're comparing the same gases? This is important. Check this out. I have CH4, that's a gas. I have C2H2, C2H4. What's happening to the number of atoms here? They're all a gas, so they're all high, but why is the absolute entropy, a measure of the degrees of freedom of my system, increasing? Because I have more atoms that can what? Move. Move, right? Therefore, more degrees of freedom. So bigger molecules, remember every bond actually moves. That's why the bond energies and bond lengths are averages. So if you got more stuff moving, more degrees of freedom. But if I compare, this, so, that's how this works. Now let's talk about this. I'm almost done, and I'll get you a break. All right, now, we're gonna write a new chart, an ah zone, okay? Okay? A what? Absolute zero zone. What we got? We got a bunch of asses in here now. Okay? We're gonna start low. Why? Because zero Kelvin has no motion. That's a third law, even though it's theoretical. Let's take graphite. What does this mean? 5.7 joules per mole. Yeah. Okay. And now, when it becomes diamond, from the A zone, we don't go for the top. Okay. Remember, always staying positive. This is like going up. That's really bothering me. So I'm going to try to straighten that up. Okay, good. Now we go here. How about what's the. Entropy, absolute entropy of graphite at tonight, of, of diamond, 2.4. Okay, now, what just happened? The delta S of my universe? Uh, is it delta S of the universe? No. No, it's of the system. Did what? You can't measure. You can't measure the entire universe with just changes of what the particles are because you don't know the heat. Okay? Look. Delta S is what? I went 5.7 to 2 points. It's going down, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is not good. What does this mean? That in order for carbon 
graphite to become diamond, I'm actually taking this graphite and I'm making it more concentrated. Does that look like that? Yeah, I'm gonna do what? Look out, look at the freedom that this has. Even though this is what? Unhybridized, we learned about this? Peas? There's still some freedom here. This is locked up in all SP3. The freedom is less. This is more structured than this is. This, you went from a what? Less, loosely, less concentrated to a concentrated. That must mean that you've got to somehow put energy into it to make it happen. By the way, in order for graphite to become diamond, you need tremendous amount of heat and pressure to force that to happen. And you guys work with that reaction, right? You guys found it was endothermic. Okay, actually it has exothermic. Doesn't it have to be exothermic? Stick with me for a second. This is so beautiful. I have a system. What's happening in my system? Carbon graphite's going to what? Carbon diamond. In my system, I'm going from a what? Less. So what's the delta S of my system is what? Decreasing, correct? That could lead to a pathway that doesn't allow it, correct? So this of my surroundings must increase. Now, here's the trick. How do we measure the entropy change of the surroundings? We can't, it's too big. But if we know the energy change, think with me for a second. If energy, and it doesn't, flowed into this, wouldn't the surroundings move slower if the Q was lost? And wouldn't the delta S of the surroundings also drop? And wouldn't that have to lead to a decrease of entropy in this reaction? And that wouldn't work. For this to work, it must mean that heat must be released. And why? We must be exothermic. By knowing how much heat was released, we know what? That's how much energy that we gave the surroundings. We must have given the surroundings enough heat to make the surroundings move fast enough and disperse outward to overcome the system's loss of entropy, and this becomes positive. That's your answer to your question yesterday, and we're gonna measure that, okay? One more demo, and then I'm gonna end this. Madness, I'll give you a break. So this is a piece of paper, okay? And that's the demo, we're over, no. <laughs> Okay, that wasn't perfect. Yeah, what happened there? It got small. Okay, here we go. So this isn't the exact reaction. This is cellulose. Cellulose is glucose, bonded to this glucose, and these beta linkages that we can't break down, but it's cellulose. We're going to write it with oxygen. It's not the same reaction, but it's combustion, so it's still oxygen. And we're going to make what? Whee! CO2 and H2O. Now, now wait a minute. Cellulose has a lot of carbons in it. We know that cellulose is made by who? Plants. Okay, good. And what did the plants do? They took CO2 out of the air and put them together and made high energy, unstable compounds that we ingest. Unfortunately, we can't ingest this, okay? So there's a lot of energy in this. These have a lot less. So if I give it some activation energy, by the way, this is activation energy. Right now, if this hump wasn't here, Everything that could burn could burn. We'd be, we'd be in hell. Okay, but we do not. Okay? So this doesn't burn because there's not enough heat to start the reaction. By the way, what's that mean? Break the bonds. Okay. So is this self-sustaining? Am I applying more? Do I, do I got to keep doing this? No. This is spontaneous. It's occurring. I am not what? Burning yet, but I will soon. Okay? Okay, now. Okay. Now that, something you shouldn't do, but the point was, that was spontaneous. We learned what spontaneity means. There was a pathway that allowed the carbon in the cellulose to hook up with the oxygen and go what? Whee! CO2's around the room. Why was there a pathway? Why was it spontaneous? Number one, heat was released, yes? What did it do to the surrounding gas molecules? Made them move faster. Made them move faster. So what happened to the delta S? 
of the surroundings. Okay, I need it. So if something is exothermic, if energy goes out of my system, it's going to make the molecules go faster and what? Disperse. Now they're going wee wee. They go faster and they disperse outward. So my surroundings are tied to the heat of the system. Now, what else? I'm going from solid phase. Solid. I'm wiggling in my fixed position. High other cellulose molecule, or high other glucose attached to. What are you guys doing? We're just, we're just normal, moving slowly. Now when I react with oxygen, I'm flying around the room hundreds of miles an hour. Whee! Okay, isn't that dispersion? I'm going from a, now this is, a, this is a liquid, by the way. Okay, but bottom line is, this would be a solid. You can still see it, sorry. But this would be a solid. A solid would go to what? Gases. Isn't there a tremendous jump in entropy? So my system's what? Entropy is going up. And that, my friends, is the always rule. So what is the spontaneous process? A allowable pathway based on a set of conditions that's self-sustaining so that once you start it, it keeps going by itself. What you can do is ride that energy pony and it can take you uphill and just chilling. I'm chilling. It's taking me up the hill. Okay, whoa! No, I broke its back. Too heavy. Okay, now, what's the opposite? By the way, we have lights going on right now because in Long Island, we take fossil fuels that have, are unstable. We burn them. They give off energy. That energy boils water. The boiling of water turns a mechanical turbine that basically spins magnets over coils of copper. It creates electricity. We burn fossil fuels. We get free energy. We call it free because it gives us the energy to do something with. Like what? Riding a pony. Now, if something is really spontaneous in one direction, can it go in the other? Have you ever seen CO2 molecules and water molecules? Hold on. And then put them together to reform the paper. Because if you want to do that, I'm going to take wee gases and put them back together and concentrate it. So what would happen to my system? And wait a minute. If it was exothermic in one direction, wouldn't I need energy? Wouldn't, I, wouldn't it be endothermic the other? So both of these would go down. And what does that mean? A non-spontaneous process means there's no what? Pathway because the delta S of the universe would have to decrease. Which is me doing what? Picking up the pony and putting, and I get as far as I what? Keep putting energy in. Riding your bus today, we had to move it by putting energy in. Okay, non spontaneous process, party people. Who creates that glucose for us? Who creates that stuff for us? These pretty little sunflower plants. They're gonna be sunflowers. But how do they get big and strong in sunflowers is what are they doing with Rubisco? They're pulling the CO2 and putting them together to make a concentrated source. But wait a minute, they need energy. This doesn't work unless there's what? Constant supply of energy. This process is non-spontaneous because if you do what? Take the light away. I just made them stop. Okay? Now they're starting. Stop, start, stop, start. I have to, this is what? Carrying the pony. The solar energy is forcing these guys to what? Photosynthesize, okay? Please understand it, it should be coming together. Hey, cell respiration, what do we do? We take a carbon fuel and we break it down into what? CO2 and water. Cell respiration is combustion, just in a slow steps, all right? And the heat that's given off keeps us warm. All right, take a break, please. That was much better than the first period. Hopefully I kept going. Good. <laughs>